Eric Redd was the third writer approached for Alien 3. By the time he joined the production, Clive Barker had had meetings with David Guiler, but turned the offer down. William Gibson had turned in two drafts of his Space Capitalist Pigs versus Space Commie story. Gibson's first draft, written in 1987, was adapted into a novel by Pat Cadigan in 2021. The second draft, from early 1988, was adapted into a comic by Johnny Christmas and an audio drama from Dirk Maggs, released in 2019, featuring Michael Behan and Lance Henriksen reprising their roles of Hicks and Bishop. As those adaptations are faithful to the source material, and pretty entertaining despite the shortcomings of said source material, I won't be going into any detail on them here. This piece will explore Red's draft and look at its legacy on the film that eventually became Alien 3, as well as beyond that. Eric Red had written two solid films in The Hitcher and Near Dark, but neither had been particularly successful at the box office, when then director Rennie Harlan recommended him to write Alien 3 towards the end of 1988. It starts off sometime after Aliens ends, with Captain Sam Smith and his squad of five Green Berets, Simpson, Avery, Anderson, Wilson and Cassidy, boarding the drifting Sulaco. They find Bishop's trunk curiously not in hypersleep. Then they find the hypersleep capsule smashed, an alien egg in each. Before they can react, a 15-foot alien swings down from the ceiling and attacks. Two weeks later, in a small, dusty Midwestern town called North Star, Sam wakes up at the family farm and finds he has a synthetic arm. He screams and his family, Father John, an army general, Mother Mary and younger siblings Karen and Mark, tell Sam he was badly hurt in a fire on his ship and the other men are dead. John and Sam drive through town, a Woolworths, a 7-Eleven, McDonald's, and note that the Simpson and Avery places are boarded up. The family's gone. John explains that there's been an increased military presence recently. They drive into a barn, which is a big elevator that descends into a space station. They meet Sam's friend, Sergeant Chong. An android works on Sam's arm, and they have a short debrief with Colonel Sinclair and Dr. Alice Rand. They press Sam about the accident, but he remembers nothing. He asks to speak to the families of his men, but is fobbed off. Back in North Star, Sam and John go to a bar and are met by locals angry at the increased military. They also want to know what happened to Sam's men and their families. One man says that he's seen Simpson alive. Sam and John leave before things can get violent. Sam sees military trucks loading up livestock on a nearby farm and asks his father what's going on. John says that he doesn't know. Next day, Sam goes back down into the space station and asks to see the tapes of the accident, only to be told they've been classified by Dr. Rand. While riding in a truck with Chong, Sam sees Simpson refueling the vehicle. Simpson, supposedly dead, doesn't recognise Sam and acts as if he's been lobotomised. Sam storms back to see the tapes, pulling a gun on the clerk when he refuses. The clerk relents, and Sam watches a hologram of a huge alien ripping his arm off along with much of his ribcage. The other men are torn apart. That night, Sam confronts his father about lying to him. John says he did it to protect Sam, otherwise he'd end up lobotomised like Simpson. After a dejected John leaves, Sam spies pigs being loaded into an army truck over the road and sneaks aboard. The truck descends into the space station to the new military levels, Sector C. He's dumped into a dark breeding room with pigs and flicks on his lighter to see what's going on. He drops the lighter after being startled by a facehugger attached to a pig and a fire starts in the straw on the ground. The facehuggers attack out of the flames and smoke as chestbursters emerge from pigs, dogs, cats and chickens. Sam narrowly escapes the huggers by climbing into a vent while sprinklers douse the fire. He makes his way into a locker room where a couple of scientists are indulging in some foreplay before they head to the zero-g room to continue. Sam gets out of the vent, showers and changes into a science outfit. He makes his way through the secret military science lab and sees his father voluntarily being injected with a wicked-looking hypodermic needle. Sam looks into a microscope in one lab and sees alien cells attacking and replacing red blood cells. Rand addresses some of the science team, explaining what Sam just saw. She also believes they can assimilate inorganic matter, envisioning living fighter jets and tanks. They all file into another large room, Sam trying to keep a low profile. He is spotted by John and Sergeant Chong, but neither give him away. 
Rand addresses the gathered people as a huge alien is lowered down behind her, fully restrained. She says they've been working on a trained alien for three months that can be used against the Russians if need be. She releases the restraints and walks up to the alien. It kills her and starts slaughtering everyone. About 25 people make it out, including Sam. John and Chong are trapped inside. Special forces arrive and Sam takes command as ranking officer. Via security cameras, they can see the alien spinning a web from dead bodies. Under one pile of bodies, John and Chong are seen alive. Sam plans to go and get them out, while others are ordered to go and get a huge construction vehicle to try and rescue everyone else. The alien, dying following breeding itself, spots the camera and destroys it with its inner jaw. Sam and some troops use a vent to get John and Chong out, as bodies of the dead are transformed into full-size aliens. Sam kills the main creature with a grenade as they escape. Meanwhile, the station personnel are evacuated to the barracks near the North Star Township. Locals turn up there, demanding to know what's happening. Sam and 25 Green Berets smash through the door into the hive, but find it empty, with a massive acid hole in the wall. As they pull back, they find Colonel Sinclair, half-transformed, and incinerate him. Aliens find and kill the scientist couple having sex in the Zero-G room. Other aliens attack Sam, John, and Chong. They have a running battle with the creatures as they burst through the ceiling and floor. Chong and his men, trapped behind a closing door, blast the aliens and acid breaches the hull, leaving them to explode from the decompression. Sam and John watch as aliens crawl out into space and up the side of the station towards the town. Sam, John and 30 Green Berets suit up and go outside to try and kill the aliens. Carnage ensues. Aliens emerge from the elevator into North Star and disappear into the night. Sam, John and the troops follow. Old Man Perkins is killed in a cornfield by the aliens. A clerk in a 7-Eleven is attacked. The Hansons go into the 7-Eleven as a chestburster emerges from the clerk and they're chased by facehuggers, narrowly escaping in their truck. The terror farmers gather at the town hall to find out what's going on and Sam shows up trying to warn them about the aliens. No one believes him till the Hansons show up confirming the story. An alien attacks the Smith farm. Mary shoots it, but ten more wait outside. In town, the people make ready a defence while a woman operates an old-style switchboard to contact the outlying farms. When they can't contact the Smith farm, Sam takes some men to investigate. Mary holds off the aliens at the farm with a Winchester rifle, knives, a garbage disposal, a pitchfork and a chainsaw. They retreat to the basement as the creatures close in and are saved at the last minute by Sam. They head back to town as the military barracks is transformed into a mass of alien cocoons. A seething horde of aliens closes in on the town as the people nervously wait. John rubs an extrusion on his arm where he had his shot earlier. Women and children huddle in the town hall. Hundreds of aliens attack and the farmers and soldiers open fire. Grenades are lobbed from the buildings on Main Street but more aliens sneak up behind them and attack. The people fall back and Sam detonates a load of dynamite, killing some of the creatures. One manages to grab Sam at one point before he shoots it point blank in the face. Two bikers with magnums fight aliens in a McDonald's parking lot. John and some Green Berets fight aliens in an A&P. One of the Green Berets named Big Hal mows down the aliens with a browning gun but is killed when he knifes an alien in the head. Everyone falls back to the town hall. Briggs the bartender grabs some grenades and jumps into an 18-wheeler, flattening the creatures. Acid starts destroying the truck as aliens swarm over it. He drives it into a petrol station and pulls the pin on a grenade, causing an almighty explosion, wiping most of the creatures out, leaving only a handful to mop up. John weeps over the flattened town and Sam sends out a mayday which is picked up by the army frigate Omaha, some three days away. They visit Mary, who was wounded in the house attack, then the Smiths head back to the farm to get some things before they evacuate. A number of the surviving townsfolk leave in a shuttle to rendezvous with the Omaha. At the Smith farm, Karen goes to farewell her cow and milk her one last time. Sam asks John about the extrusion on his arm. Acid squirts from the cow's udder and a six-legged creature bursts out. John explains that the shot was alien cells. They couldn't train the aliens, but thought they could create a human-alien hybrid that could be controlled, and John wouldn't have it tested on anyone other than himself. He starts to transform and screams at his family to get out. Sam and Mark grab Karen and tear back to the town in their truck. The John alien stalks the farm, biting cows. An alien mosquito bites a chicken, which transforms 
and tries and fails to fly, landing in a reservoir. Back at the town hall, a nurse pours water from a tap, handing out glasses to the sick and wounded. Mary declines. The mosquito alien continues spreading contagion in a cow herd. The Smiths encounter three cow aliens on the road, and Sam shoots them with a rocket launcher, running over the others. As they get back to town, it starts to disintegrate around them, the ground falling into the space station below, and buildings collapsing. They find Mary, but the other people from the town hall have fused together into a two-storey high alien. It chases them as they head to another shuttle launch bay. North Star continues to fall apart, and they end up driving on the girders that previously supported the ground, flames erupting all around them. Reaching the shuttle launch silo as it collapses, they find their way blocked by the John alien. Sam pleads with the thing that was his father, and the creature picks them up and places them on the launch platform. With the launch tube blocked, Sam smashes the shuttle through North Star's dome as the entire station transforms into a gigantic xenomorph, absorbing John into it. Thinking they're finally safe, Sam puts his family into hypersleep, but as he goes into hypersleep himself, the shuttle begins to transform. He smashes his way out and breaks his family out of their cryotubes and gets them into spacesuits before the shuttle can devour them, minus his synthetic arm which was bitten off by a hypersleep chamber. He shoots at the control console and the shuttle screams in pain. The former station draws the shuttle back towards it, but before the shuttle is completely transformed, Sam launches four nukes at the station, and the family blasts out of the airlock. The station is obliterated, leaving Sam, Mary, Karen and Mark floating in space as the Omaha closes in to pick them up. So, first a disclaimer. This is a first draft. Most first drafts are pretty average and just provide the basis for further drafts. All the first drafts for Alien 3 were pretty average. And being a first draft, it's completely forgivable that all the characters are completely devoid of personality, especially in a sci-fi action-adventure script like this. It's not a character study. So are there any positives? There's a lot of action, and there's a lot of gore, if that's your thing. It's only a 98-page script, but at least half of it is action sequences. Unfortunately, a lot of it comes across as repetitive, with the only novel part being the firefight on the outside of the station, and perhaps Briggs running over the aliens and incinerating them with a truck. That said, the problems you might have picked up on during the overview of the story only really scratch the surface. One of the main issues is the setting, a dusty midwestern town perpetually stuck in the 1980s on top of a space station in deep space. Much has been made of Vincent Ward's wooden planet in later drafts, but there is an attempt to explain that in the story, the monk's rejection of technology. There's no attempt at an explanation in the script for why this town is in space, nor why it's stuck in the 1980s. It's the kind of place they write songs about leaving on a midnight train going anywhere. There's a woman using an old-style telephone switchboard at one point. What happened to the vid phones from the second film? Nor is there an explanation as to what the space station is normally used for. The farmers complain about the increased military presence, so it's not a military station, despite the fact that John, Sam and all their men live in North Star. And on top of that, the station is named Sulaco for no apparent reason. And so is the shuttle the Smiths escape in at the end. Even if this was a placeholder name, literally any other name would have been less confusing. The story opens with an alien inexplicably being on the Sulaco, but that's a problem with every Alien 3 script, except David Toohey's draft. The time frames are confused as well. Sam is out for two weeks, and we're led to believe the army have created or bred hordes of facehuggers in this time since they were found on the Sulaco. Yet later on, Rand and John say they've been working on taming the aliens for three months. Which brings us to the aliens themselves. The life cycle is out the wazoo. All you need to do is be able to be bitten by an alien mosquito, and within minutes you'll change into one of the creatures. There's a lot of facehuggers here, but other than impregnating some animals, they serve no purpose. Eric Red has said that he came up with the bio-experimentation angle as a next logical step, but that angle was already explored in the Gibson drafts. Admittedly, it is amplified here with myriad hybrids, as well as the shuttle and entire space station becoming an alien. The hybrid angle would be repeated in the Tui draft, but dialed down with Ward and the final film to a single creature bred from a quadruped. There's no mention of the queen at all, but aliens are routinely described as being 15 feet tall. The sequence where Sam stows away with the pigs to find the breeding chamber full of animals seems particularly silly. 
There's no controls or safeguards in place. It's just open slather with huggers attacking livestock with gay abandon. The idea of having straw on top of this for the comfort of animals that they're sacrificing for science and yet not monitoring leads to a fire which is never mentioned again. Wouldn't that be of concern to Dr. Rand or Colonel Sinclair? And Sam escapes through an air duct large enough for a man, but apparently none of the aliens, who love air ducts, follow suit. I have to admit Dr. Rand getting killed as soon as she releases the alien did come as a shock. But what follows with the alien wrapping people up in cocoons so they can transform into full-size aliens again makes little sense in the context of their life cycle. Ditto alien DNA morphing inorganic material. Acid does what acid does when it suits the plot, like when Chong gets sucked out into space and explodes, or when Sam runs over two aliens and nothing happens whatsoever. Where the alien mosquito comes from is anyone's guess, as is an alien chicken falling into a reservoir, almost instantaneously transforming people who drink the water into a giant two-story creature. And speaking of Chong, he's described as being Japanese, with a Chinese name, and such good friends with Sam that the latter calls him Chink as a term of endearment. Then when Chong dies, Sam honours his friend by saying, Poor old Chong. And there's a sex scene, which is soft porn, gratuitous violence, and serves no purpose whatsoever beyond that. One of the participants in the sex scene, Lauren, oddly has her name changed to Terry at one point, and later Mark, very not one of the participants, is variously named John Jr., almost as if Red was having trouble keeping track of character names. The end features a shuttle that everyone had forgotten about, but would have been worth mentioning earlier so maybe some of the wounded could evacuate. And not just a shuttle, one armed with nukes that are so easy to launch it can be done using a control console that's morphing into an alien and has already been shot to bits by a guy with only one arm. And so to the legacy of the Red Script. Other than the inexplicable aliens on the Sulaco and an animal hybrid, nothing survived to the final film. And while I'm not suggesting that this script was the inspiration for media that followed, the alien DNA rapidly spreading around creating monsters isn't miles away from Prometheus or Covenant, the alien mosquito also being similar to David's genetic shock troops. Human-alien hybrids appeared in the original Colonial Marines comics from Dark Horse, as did a huge alien space station, though in that case it was just hive material rather than a living entity. We had a huge variety of animal-alien hybrids from Kenner, though sadly no chickens. Though speaking of chickens, one appears on the cover of Aliens No. 8 from Marvel, as aliens run loose in an agricultural colony. Farm animals as hosts would be revisited in Vincent Ward's script, and even in the original cut of the final film, before the ox was changed to a dog. The Aliens Earth Angel comic features an attack on small town USA, complete with bikers. There's also a scene of Sam watching a video feed of the alien cocooning victims, only for it to smash the camera on the other end with its inner jaw, same as what happens in Covenant. The aliens being tamed for military purposes was explored in comics such as Labyrinth, Rogue, as well as Alien Resurrection, and a number of video games. The name Eric was used in the final film for one of the characters, along with William, Vincent, David, and Lawrence. Eric Redd, who turned in the script on February 7, 1989, defended it at the time, largely blaming issues on David Guiler and Walter Hill's lack of direction, but would later completely disown the script, saying it was the rushed result of a number of story conferences and interference, and was ultimately utter crap. Needless to say, everyone at Brandywine and Fox agreed, and Rennie Harlan, frustrated by the lack of progress, walked from the project. He would go on to direct Die Hard 2, Cliffhanger, the Long Kiss Goodnight, and Deep Blue Sea. Eric Redd worked solidly through the 1990s as a writer and director. David Guiler, Walter Hill and Gordon Carroll had now spent a great deal of Fox's money on two writers and a director for over a year and still had nothing to show for it. 